I woke up as the door woke open. Stripe, for some reason, had rolled out of the bunk, and he looked like a bulldog, and he had a sock in his mouth. I don't know why he had a sock in his mouth, but he looked like some fucking dog. And Opie's over top of him, yelling and screaming, I can't believe you fucking did that. How in the fuck, what were you thinking? Why the fuck did you do that? And I'm like, what happened? He goes, well, Stripe can't fucking reach, you know, piss in the toilet because he's too short. So what he did was he grabbed the bus driver's good Guinness glasses and decided to fucking let it roll out in the front lounge. Hey, this is Party Like a Rockstar podcast, and I'm your host, Joel. Today's episode is brought to you by Misha's Kind Foods. They're an LA-based small business making the world's finest non-dairy cheese on the market today. They're lactose-free, paleo, keto, kosher, perev, and 100% vegan. If you like what you see, check out the next video. If you like this video, please subscribe and like by clicking the little round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or other guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle is Joel Rohde. If you haven't already read my book, Memoir of a Rohde, it's now available through Amazon and paperback Kindle or as an audiobook. I hope you enjoy the show. What's up, bad boy? What's going on, buddy? How much? Hold on, my, my technical crew is helping me. <laughs> Am I good now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right, are we ready? You want to grab a beer or anything, or you're good to go, Ron? Oh, yeah, let me get a beer. Just kidding. Yeah. A Coke. Okay, good on you. All right, cool. Jason Attaboy Stalter has worked for Roger Waters, Van Halen, the Eagles, ACDC, Ozfest, Prince, Elton John, Stone Temple Pilots, Seal, John Mayer, Jay-Z, Mary J. Blige, Brian Adams, Annie Lennox, Ricky Martin, The Who, Kelly Clarkson, Nine Inch Nails, The Rolling Stones, Fiona Apple, and Typo Negative. My second guest is Ron Kroom, and he's really worked for Nobody Important, so let's go. All right, Ron Crew. Ron Crew. He's worked for the Eagles, Guns N' Roses, Poison with me, Maxwell, Kiss, Garbage, Brian Adams, the Family Values Tour, and Ozfest. Was that better than your nobody, Ron? Yeah, you know what? I was trying to boost your ego. A lot of people between the two of us. We've covered a lot of bands. Right. Yeah. That's a lot. Matter yeah. of fact, I took over the Eagles after Ron left the Eagles in like 03 or 04. It was like, so yeah, there's been a lot of gigs where it's like, you know, he ended up ending a tour with them and then I'd pick it up right after. Did so, you think we were on Guns N' Roses when I left? No, luckily not. I didn't, thank God. <laughs> Maybe Felton, I don't know, somebody took it over. I don't remember who, but yeah, Ron I remember ended when up, uh, on the Eagles for me. That was that was uh that was a smooth take transition, I think. Yeah. Ron ended up uh dating Ricky Martin after I left that tour. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry, that was bad. That was bad. So, Ron, you got any really bad jokes for us? Because you're my, you're the king. Oh shoot! Come uh, on, am I putting you on the spot? Well, yeah, I can do the early bird joke. Do we know so, the early bird joke? Out of boy. Oh, I've heard it. Okay, Ron, what do we got? There's a worm. He's doing his thing one day, and he's doing his little pops his head up out of the ground sees a beautiful sunrise. He's like, wow, this is amazing. I've never seen a sunrise like this before. This is so cool. That's a very well-versed worm. So, but he had never heard of the early bird. So the early bird swooped down and got the worm. And he's like, well, what the hell? What? So he's going through the word, the bird's body and he gets to his butt and sticks his head out and the bird is taking off, right? He's, he's flying away. <clears throat> so he sticks his head out and he screams like, ah, because everything is so far down and he goes whoa where am i and he goes oh you're five thousand feet the bird says you're five thousand feet and the worm goes oh my gosh are you shitting me <laughs> oh wow that's a winner thank you for sharing <laughs> so that's there you go there's a there's a, a bad joke to start with it's a winner you got oh, any good man. ones about riggers <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't want to hear that joke. I'm just oh, they're every, every day with the rigors. <laughs> yeah. I knows what joke. Ron knows what joke. 
All right. So, uh, Attaboy, I got the opportunity to see your 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 video on the Ozfest thing, <laughs> which I thought was kind of. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I remember cleaning the four odd, even in the damn warehouse. I don't, no. <laughs> I don't think nobody, I, nobody cleans four odd. I never, I don't, but I love, I love the, how the show was set up when I watched the brief thing, you know, and at the end, the guy gets like a phone call from his girlfriend. She's like, I slept with another guy on the road. He's so upset. I'm like, what a puss, you know, <laughs> I don't remember anything like that. Can you imagine being on the road and be like, Oh, my girlfriend broke up with me. Did they, everybody would just bag on you until the end of God knows. Yeah, you don't let that kind of thing out because you're just, you know, you're just adding fuel to the fire at that point. Anyway, I did like your appearance. I thought that was the best part. It was, uh, I made those, those band kids, I made, when it was all said and done, they armor all 3,000 feet of four odd. No, you didn't. They yeah. really, really? Uh, I thought it was just a TV show. Answer. No, no, no. It was, I made them do it. I was like, I told MTV, MTV was running out of stuff for them to do. And I was like, you know what? It's like, we always... Even when I was a stage when I first started, everybody hated feeder cable. Everybody hated doing feeder cable, running feeder cable, whatever it was. Everybody bitched and moaned about it. But then it was always like, well, you know, you know, if you're going to really be a pain in the ass, we're going to make you clean it. So for years, you know, I always hear a joke. I'm like, you know what? I went to the producers. I'm like, I would really want to do this because nobody's done this. I really want to do this. They're like, yeah, sure, whatever. It's like, what do you need? I'm like, well, let me go do the runners all, you know, go to the, and talk to the runners. And uh, put down the list. They came back an hour later from AutoZone with a shitload of uh, red rags and bottles of Armor All. So then I led them over to my feeder box three, which was my three 100-foot runs all in one box. Made them pull all three 100s out, made them untape all of it, made them do each cable twice, and made them relume it. Two and a half hours to six of them. <laughs> That's awesome. In the end, 3,000 feet. Like Opie was doing cartwheels. We were up in Detroit at Pine Knob. He could nobody believed I was making him do it. You know, I was having a blast. I thought it was hilarious. That's great. Yeah. I remember when Ron came out on Poison. So I, I just remember talking to Ron and I'm just bitching and complaining about this guy going on and on. And poor Ron was the one going through all the cable because he was remarking everything. And so he was the one going through everything. He's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> pulling all the cable out of the case while i'm just standing there <laughs> i still am a great help huh Man. no <laughs> all right we'll move on to other things so what tour did you guys first meet on no uh, we worked in the shop i don't think we actually toured together yeah we were always we were always crossing always crew chiefs, something but you don't put two crew chiefs on the same tour so so you guys were both in the what lsd to shop I was yeah. out of the Nashville office. Ron always worked out of L.A. But then we were always crossing paths, you know, when we were prepping or doing stuff like that. Or like when Ron, you know, like, I'm, how much did you come through Nashville, Ron? Uh, maybe three or four times. You know, that was the whole thing. It was like, you know, I was from, you know, the, the mid-90s. I was, this, you know, stole the shop kid, stuff like that. So when I started touring, then I started seeing more. Even after tour, me and Russ Felton. Russ didn't know my real name for the first couple of years, and we were on the road together. You know, five I, know, years I didn't know. Yeah. And it was like one day, where I, think, I can't remember what tour we're on. He goes, is that your real name? And I'm like, yeah, Russ. It's like, you know, thanks for, you know, being observant. You know, <laughs> but that's Russ. <laughs> What's his name? The other brother, that's his name. Yeah. I always accuse him of, uh, remember that movie Twins with Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger? What am I, the leftover shit? Yeah, that's exactly. I told him he's the lesser of two Feltons. You know, <laughs> got all the personality and all the smile and everything else and the talent, and Russ got all the shit DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we nice to one another? <laughs> oh, man. You gotta, you gotta love it. So back in the day, I read here that Quiet Riot paid you $10. Was that too much, Jason? <laughs> oh, God, at the time, I thought I was... A, living the dream you know it was my first gig you know i was like oh man this is great 10 bucks for unloading the trailer another 10 for running spotlight that night i was like man i made it you know it's like i'm gonna do this shit i had no idea that i was gonna be where i'm at now you know yeah i read so it was a little theater and the what's the deal so the little theater was just a place you would go as a kid i mean you went there as a it was the al rosa villa columbus ohio it got 
unfortunately, it became known for the shooting and killing of Dimebag Daryl oh. from Damage Plan. Um, that happened in 2004. I was actually on the Eagles, and I was flying home from Australia when I heard about the shooting. Um, and that would – I don't. I think the club didn't really – they were still open up until like last year, but it had a stigma about it from that point on. And, it, you know, and it really sucked because we, that's where all the like the eighties bands went. There was, there was a whole bunch of bands or clubs in Ohio, the Agoras, um, you know, different ones, rock clubs, you know, and the Al Rosa was one of the, you know, more famous ones. They opened up in the early seventies. Yeah. You know, but then after that, that really, that really took a toll. Yeah. And so you were working there and then you went to the shop after? Um, I, I pretty much in four years in Columbus. I started in 93 and uh, I, I went from the Al Rosa Village to the Newport Music Hall, which was the old Columbus Agora. It's on it's still there. The Newport. Um, it was the old Ohio State Theater from the 1920s. Um, they still do boatloads of shows in there. Um I was in there for a little while and that led me to going out and doing steel because it was a company called quality cruise. So I ended up going out and doing like Pink Floyd, um, Grateful Dead, and then the Rolling Stones as a steel stagehand uh, in 94. And you know, I just kind of went through the ranks in Columbus, you know, I started freelancing and working for local companies and then, you know, regional company, but then I always wanted to go on the big rock tours yeah. and LSD was like, the the company that I really had targeted and I'd called you know LA over and over and over again Barry Claxton had just taken over at the time and always got to run around oh maybe next week we'll have something give me a call then you know I'd call call I wouldn't hear nothing a couple weeks later try again oh, I'll call again in a few weeks maybe we'll have something after about a year of that you know you're just like yeah whatever so I called out Nashville not knowing that Nashville you know didn't they didn't correspond the same way. Mm-hmm. So when I called down there, they're like, Hey, if you can be down here in a few days, you know, uh, you're hired. So I kind of like in the back door, got through LSD through the Nashville shop and just started there. And then I was a shop kid for a while, you know, kind of went that route. That's cool. And what about you, Ron? So you started where? Well, in high school, uh, I, was was kind of planning on going into computers. I kind of like computers, and I took a computer class, and they had Radio Shack TRS eighties, which I don't know if you remember what those are. Were you the first person in your family to get into high school? <laughs> the TRS eighties were crap. So basically, I'm like, this isn't going anywhere. So I skipped computers and went and learned lighting because that looked a lot more interesting and had more technology to it. If I would have waited another year before making that decision when the Apple IIs came in and the computer department had Apple computers, I probably would have stayed in computers. Oh. So that's how I got into lighting and production and and uh, ended up making my way to light and sound design in Los Angeles via a contact in Louisville, Kentucky. So. And then Attaboy wanted to be a sound guy. It, it was yeah. a 10-year road. It's a 10, 10 years from when I decided to do lighting before I actually got to do any big tours. 10 years? It, it was a 10-year trip to, to make it to that point. Damn, man. I've just How long did you work in the shop? Off, off, That's a long meter, time. Drive trucks, whatever it took to finally reach that point to where I didn't have to, I could just be a crew chief and not have to do any of that other stuff. So what was your first uh, nationwide tour? In rock and roll, it was the Horde Fest. Oh. But I had toured before that with theater. I didn't tell anybody that when I started at Light and Sound Design, but I had toured theater before. <laughs> Why? <laughs> uh, that you would have been eaten up and spit out. <laughs> They're like, well, that's a wussy job. And then you would have, yeah, wouldn't have gotten in. So I just said I had toured. I didn't say with what. You know, was- Fuji used to do theater before. I think he toured with theater before he started doing. Uh, I don't know actually what the fuck. Fuji's a whole different story, though. I mean, you know, <laughs> you couldn't tell. You couldn't tell he did theater just by the way he is. <laughs> a little over the top. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. All right. So I've been trying to work on this joke. I was told last night it was horrible. <laughs> so 
I'm going to test it on you guys because Ron has such a great sense of humor. But I was up at I was up in Lodi. That's where my girlfriend's from. And they got a dog. It's a German Shepherd dog. And the only thing it cares about is catching the ball. It's all it gives a shit about. I woke up in the morning at three o'clock to take a piss. And the dog is sitting there like eager beaver, just like ball. And it's like, oh, it's three o'clock fuck morning. So I was and then my buddy came over. My buddy was a fit dude. He He hiked the Appalachian trail, man. He hiked from Georgia up to New York. It took him like a year. So he's throwing the ball. He's throwing the ball. And eventually the dog, huh? At three in the morning. No, this was the night after. So actually we went to a winery, Jason, you were just saying you're doing uh, gigs at a winery. We we (laughs) were in a winery in Northern California. We're just catching up. I hadn't seen the guy for a while. It was my old roommate. And, uh, he starts throwing the ball and he totally wears the dog out. The dog is, is hurting. It's great. Right. So her, her uh, stepdad goes in and takes the dog and he goes, he needs a break and they give him water. And the dog is looking out the door. Like he wants to come play, but he's tired. And I'm thinking, what if like Pete Rose had a dog, <laughs> that poor dog, you'd be like throwing the ball, throwing the ball. And the dog would be like, I can't take it anymore. Pete. <laughs> Not a good joke. No. Yeah. They said it sucked too. I thought that was awesome. So anyway, it'd be a little bit more of a hook. There need to be a hook of something in there. That and a lot of sarcasm. <laughs> maybe Pete, maybe it's because of the Pete Rose thing. Maybe it was like Ken Griffey Jr. People are like <laughs> he was a great thrower. <laughs> Probably need to have someone that's been bad with a dog. <laughs> All right, tell me a good rock and roll story then. <laughs> oh, so this one time. Oh wait, I can't tell that one. And this other time. Oh wait. So when, when I went out on the poison tour, Joel, you didn't even want to be there. I wasn't very pleased with things. Yeah, I was. that was a really messed up situation. I was walking in. The crew chief was, was gone already. You guys were just doing shows without a lead. The lighting designer was off the top. The production manager was like, just make it work. Who was, who was the guy that you replaced? Chainsaw. Yeah, Chainsaw. Who? He's buddies with the Feltons. And I'm like, tell him to come oh. on. They're like, well, what if he still well, hates yeah, you? I don't know. I know what you mean. Yeah. Or out of Atlanta. He didn't get along. There was some kind of spat. Him and the lighting designer weren't getting along. So was he kept calling me Rifkin. There? My name's Joel. It's not Rifkin. <laughs> that was the fight. <laughs> I want to bring him on here, man. And he's like, what if he still hates you? I'm like, I don't know. Who gives I, remember, a shit? I showed up and I'm like, so what do you do? And you're like, I don't know. And you were running chain motors out. And I'm like, well, you're here for a reason. You're going to have to learn how to do something. Oh, I must have hated you. <laughs> well, we went out to drink afterwards when we finally had a day off, and then it was all better. So we go out to drink, Jason. So I don't know this guy's name even. He just started that day, and I could give a shit about anything at that point. It wasn't just poison. I just didn't give a fuck. So we go out drinking, and first I was bitching for sure about that guy, and then I'm sure it just turned into a, a party fest. So in the morning, I wake up. The bus door is open. We have porn on two TVs. There's just food everywhere, man. And I wake up in my bunk and I come out of the bus and we're in a parking lot and I just see Ron. He's like face down in the grass and I don't know his name. So I'm like, boss, you know, boss, you gotta wake up, boss. And I, and I look up and there's Mark Hogue and he's just smiling. He goes, oh, God. He goes, well, oh, this is nice, boys. I'm like, oh, fuck you know so i don't know what to do so and then the porn's just blaring i remember so and i'm thinking like the the bus door is open we're gonna be in so much we're gonna get yelled at so and i think i blamed cc i'm like cc did it so uh hogue used to do this thing called the gig butt news and it was this newsletter that was honestly very very funny man hogue is really funny and so he was like, well, our whole lighting department was passed out in the parking lot today. So let's see how loading goes. And I was just sort of like, oh, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And that's how I met Ron. So that's why he's still boss. He's still boss. Did Hulk ever chop off uh, or uh, bolt cutter any of your guys' latches? No. <laughs> that used to be, I guess that was a thing on Aerosmith back in the 90s. Like if your latches were down on like open cases or whatever, where you can like nick your leg, he, you know. The rumor I can't remember who was telling me this. It might have been. Uh, I'm trying to remember. There was one of the one of the lighting guys was telling me he'd come over and cut your you know, the latches right off your road case. Really? 
Yeah, it was like you know, because you, you fuck somebody's up, you know, really good, get a good oh, yeah. run by them, and you know, just rip you up. So yeah, he he'd shear them right off. If that was if they were down. I believe that I could see him being tough guy, tough guy Hulk. Yeah, it's in the two thousands where he was sort of like, I don't even know why I hire you. It was and like, he would have fired like, me in the nineties. Yeah, it was like like Tom Best. It was either Tom Best was telling me that or or Matt. Um, God, what was Matt's last name? Wyman, Matt Wyman. Mm-hmm. It was one of those guys. Was, man, they there were so many guys that were like just on that uh, one fucking Aerosmith tour in the late nineties. Seven like the seven seven lives or something nine lives. That's the one where they did lots of like drugs. Three and a half years, you know. There was always new crew guys, except for Tim Gallup. Tim Gallup always seemed to be the one, you know, you know, the one key ringer of that crew. No matter how many times you come through the town that tour, he was the one constant. I tried to get him on here. He refused. The Gipper? Uh, I think I did write to him, but uh, I don't know if he really refused. Did you know <laughs> that Ron used to work at uh, McDonald's? I didn't put that on my paper. <laughs> tell us your mcdonald's story this one's good okay so yeah well, i well it's in high school and you know working at mcdonald's is that was the big i lived in a small town that was like the only really thing you could do was work at mcdonald's so uh i was working with a buddy of mine he worked the front grill and i was i do dishes we were closing up and uh and this is a small little town like twenty seven thousand people it's not very big take the trash out at night you know we open up the back door we pile all the trash in the back take the take the trash out you're not supposed to open the door but there's nobody around there's there's never a problem so my buddy comes back to see if i'm done with dishes yet if i need help i'm like yeah you know i gotta take trash out so he's okay i'll do it for you so he opens the door and runs the trash to the the dumpster well while he's back there two guys come in with ski mask on one guy's holding something wrapped in a towel and and the other guy just points a gun on my face and goes where's the money and i'm like what are you talking about? What, what do you mean, where's the money? I thought it was somebody, you know, somebody playing a joke. Well, it wasn't a joke. It was a real gun. And so he puts the gun to my head, pops my neck around, and he goes, get on the floor. And I'm like, boom. And I just mopped the floor. It was soaking wet. <laughs> well, I'm only like 16, 17 years old, right? So laying down on the floor, soaking wet. <clears throat> so he goes around and he and the, the girls that worked the front counter were helping, like, wipe down all the stainless steel. So one of them was around the corner. He gets her on the floor, comes around. One of the other girls sees me. She goes, Ronnie, why are you laying on the floor? And the manager hears that. And he's like, hey, get the work in there. And the manager's office is around the corner from where we are. And there's the drive through window there. So the other guy with the long thing wrapped in the towel, which looked kind of like, a, like a, a shotgun or something, he had backed up into the drive through window. So when the manager came out of the office, the guy was right behind him and just thumped him on the back with the gun. So, so now the manager's there, everyone's on the floor, except my buddy that's running trash out. He comes running back in, right into the middle of the situation. And the guy, the guy with the pistol stands on my head, puts the gun in my ear, balancing on one foot on my head and goes, do you want your buddy to die? So my friend goes, no. He goes, well, get on the ground. So, my, so now everybody's on the ground, but the manager. And the guy's knife falls out of his, his, his jacket or whatever he's wearing right next to my hand. I'm like, oh, I'm going to die. This sucks. So they take the manager into the office. They make all of us go into the walk-in cooler. They didn't get any money. They, they, the, the safe had a padlock on it and a, and a dial. They, they couldn't get in. They finally just gave up and left. But we had to go into the freezer. And so when I came out, I was frozen. The whole front of me was frozen. And uh, I didn't like last at McDonald's much longer after that. That's my McDonald's story. Did he get his knife back? Oh, he picked it up. Yeah. He, yeah. He, he reached down and grabbed it and put his knife back in. But I thought for sure he was going to think I was reaching for it. That yeah. Was a See, told you it was a good story, Jason. Minimum wage and getting that's robbed. The, and we didn't even mental, put the thing off. Yeah. That's the mental scarring that happened from that is what made him a roadie. Well, that guy is Russell Felton. <laughs> <laughs> probably wasn't. It was probably both him and Glenn, like you know, holding up McDonald's. That's the end of the story. That, that it takes a lot to shock me now. After that, yeah, that's why he's tough. So, like when when Charlie Hernandez was yelling at me, like 
chewing my ass out. I'm like, okay, this is a little worse than the guy standing on my head with a gun, but. <laughs> Why was he chewing you out? Uh, something went wrong during the STP set and he wasn't happy. So as the crew chief, you have to take the blame because it was a lighting issue. So I told him it never happened again. And he said, okay. And then the whole load in had stopped because Charlie was going, Charlie was just chewing me up and spitting me out. And I was just like, okay, sorry. Okay. So then Charlie walked away and I'm like, everybody back to work. <laughs> Come on. We got to load out. Are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, no, get the show loaded out. <laughs> I don't know. I got yelled at every day. I got pretty used to it. <laughs> it's it's fun when the guy's yelling, yelling at you and you're like the size of his foot, you know, I'm like, yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Yes, sir. Fuck. I'm worthless. I know, sir. <laughs> All right. So here's another one I was thinking. Could be good. <laughs> if you're a psychic, you could put like names of people in the window every day, but common names. You can't put like attaboy. But if you were to put like Jason, people would be more inclined to go into the psychic shop because it'll be, dude, the psychic knew something about me today. But no psychics do this. Do you lay awake at night thinking of these things? Yeah, like all day and all night. <laughs> Changing the world one you? psychic story at a time. Did you see your name in a window one time and you went in? No, nobody ever says Joel because it's like not that many people are called Joel. And there's a lot of Hispanic Joels, but maybe English isn't their first language and they'll just keep driving. So Joel Young, Joel. Probably a couple other Joels. Wow, you're like a Joel database. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, ACDC, what have we got? <laughs> oh, man. That was... uh. That was a great band to work for. They were really cool. Was, um, that was that was the whole thing when I started touring, and I was with Opie. I did Oz, you know, started with Ozfest '99, and you cut out. You started Ozfest what year? Yeah, nine, uh, '99 was my first year. The, the, it's kind of funny because what made me a lighting guy and what got me on finally on tour was the same situation was when I first started Dial Rosa in Columbus, I wanted to run sound. I, I went to recording engineering school and stuff like that. And uh, at the time, the uh, house guy was had a major addiction problem and disappeared with a waitress's car and a bunch of money and oh, was shit. not seen again. So they're like, hey, uh, they're like, hey, well, we can't have him back if he shows up, so we're going to get to run lights. And they see me like coiling an xlr up on deck and and like, uh, that's the like, guy who calls barry every two weeks <laughs> yeah so it's like uh so they're like hey kid how do you feel like being our new house lighting guy and i'm like well i want to be a sound guy and they're like I'll start paying you i'll do lights <laughs> and then that was it so fast forward to that ozfest 99 in nashville it was the third show of the tour I knew the shop wouldn't get us tickets or anything to go watch the band. I wanted to see Sabbath. I never saw the original Sabbath. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to work as a stagehand that day. So I played hooky from the shop, said, you know, I had something else I had to do. Went to Starwood Amphitheater, worked the load in, and one of the LSD guys got canned that morning. So opened this and had it out with him. I could fire him that day. So they're like – during the day, you know, it was all the, most of the guys were from the Nashville shop. It was Russ Felton, Dan Janikowski, uh, Tim Horton, you know, all these guys that I had worked with or around or with preps and stuff. Is that when you were in the shop? Huh? Was coach there? Yeah, uh, yeah, he was. You know, and um, they were like, "Hey, kid, how you feel about coming out with us?" And I'm like, "Yeah, whatever." You know, the show, you know, the company will never let me leave the shop. You know, it's like is one of those things where you got kind of pigeonholed in where, you know, like, well, we can't find anybody else to do the stuff that he does in the warehouse. We're not going to let him go out on tour and lose him. But during that middle of that day, then they introduced me to Opie and, and Sonny Satterfield was running lights at time. So as I started getting introduced to everybody, they're like, yeah, this is our the replacement we want to have. So because of somebody, once again, being all fucked up on drugs, I ended up getting the job. That was my first day on tour. I got flown out to Charlotte to meet up you know, with the gig, and that was it. I was uh, out. 
So Opie looked, took a liking to me. I kind of became a pet. So you can basically, that I means I basically got beat on. It's like if there was a hazing to be had, then they were like, yeah, your ass is up. Did Sonny fuck was, with you? Huh? Did Sonny fuck with you? Oh, all the time. I mean, that was that was the whole thing. It was like, you know, that was one of the main things. Like, yep, let's see if you can do your job and still take the beating that we give you. And if you can, we'll let you, you know, we'll let you hang. And, you know, I made it through it all. And What kind of know, crap did they do to you? Man, I don't know if I can really say. It wasn't me personally. It was some of the things they, you know, some of the situations they made me do. Um, oh, shit. Wear your harness like out in the crowd or something. Oh, well, yeah, that was, that was, that was part of it, but it was Fair. what they were making me <laughs> basically troll for uh, certain individuals, certain <laughs> very promiscuous individuals, but I right. would have to be look like, a, they would make me look like a complete idiot or a complete dumbass and see if I could still, you know, entice somebody to come backstage to do. Did, you, did they ever make you have pigtails? Huh? Pigtails would have been fucking. No, Obi tried to get me to do corn rolls and Alicia Keys, and I would not do corn rolls. I was like, corn rolls are great. No, I was like, hell no. And they tried and tried and tried. And I was like, uh uh. Alicia with me, they'd like, go look your best, Rifkin. (laughs) I still wouldn't find anybody to bring backstage. (laughs) Alicia's hairdresser was like, she was all about it. She was going to do all my hair and stuff. Like, nope, nope, I ain't doing it. I'd wear my harness out in the crowd. I didn't give a crap. Everybody thought that was great. No, no I had my harness, my tool belt, this and that. They made me want to look like some kind of like, you know, southern, you know, like some kind of like, you know, cop on patrol wearing the most stupidest shit I could. This basically just put everything and everything over me. If they'd had, if they could put ropes on me, chains, this and that, harness. You know, how stupid could we make me look, and then go out and then try to, you know, find party people for backstage. It Were you just, around, Ron, with the Miss Mississippi stuff? Was that before you? I don't remember that. All right, we'll move on. <laughs> I don't know. There's this girl I brought back, and she was a runner-up for Miss Mississippi, and all these assholes ruined it for me. And uh, the long story short is at the end, the band was like, we only did it because she was so good-looking, and we didn't understand why she liked you. And I'm like, and this is why you and your music suck. <laughs> Fuck all you. Oh yeah, I was so 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 mad though. I wasn't kidding. I was so angry. Was Man, angry. yeah. So uh, <laughs> anyway, that Opie took liking to me. I could take the beatings, take the hit, take the work. So the following year, I went back to Oz Fest again. Why did typo negative and cold chamber? That was a lot of fun. That was the only theater tour or like club slash theater small gig tour that I ever did. Doing House of Blues, um, small rock club stuff like that with production. Was Moby um, on that tour? Yeah, it was me and Moby were uh, out there together. And uh, that was a bunch of buffoonery. That was something that would get me me too in a hurry. But yeah. it, was, it was some funny shit. Um, and then, uh, yeah, then I went to OzFest and Hope said, you know what? You know, you, you keep keep your nose clean and I'll, I'll take you on ACDC. And the day we ended eight, uh, OzFest 2000, the following day, I was out to replace the dimmer guy on uh, ACDC, which had just started in Kansas City. And then we just kept on rolling. So I just didn't stop. Did you guys pull any funny shit on ACDC or no? Oh, all the time. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I guess I could tell them because it's it's more funny on me. It was uh, I never had. You're OK with food. making fun of you. I had I never had to, had space cakes before. It was uh, we were when the first time I was over in Europe, and I know was I was never a pot smoker. I was always a drinker. Yeah. So we ended up getting a whole bunch of hash brownies, and when I tried to smoke, I'd never really get high. Probably because I just never did it right. So we're loading out in, in Hanover, and there's batches of them on the buses. Everybody had them, you know, there was a, a, so everybody could have them, you know, for the trip down to Switzerland. Well, I ended up grabbing a couple Uh-oh. <laughs> and eat them on the way to the shower and shit like that. Um, so I ended up eating three 
<laughs> and then I get on the bus. And uh, this leg of the tour, I'm on Opie's bus. The rest of the lighting crew is on another bus. So that that leg, Opie had all of his all of everybody that loved hanging out together. So it was like me and Mike Kennard, uh, Squid, um, Chris Bellog. Uh, you know, there was a whole bunch of us. Uh, Sid Price. We were, you know, it was everybody that loved to have you know this fun together and. I'm just sitting there, and Ope's like, have you had any of those yet? And I'm like, yeah, Ope, I've had three. And he goes, yeah, bullshit. So he takes Squid's about ready to bite into one. He rips it out of Squid's hand and puts it in my face. He goes, you're going to eat this one. And I'm like, Ope, I've already ate three. He's like, I don't think, I think you're lying to me. So I end up eating that one. So he goes, you know what? You need one more. I go, Dale, I have had, this is, this is now four. Grabs another one. Like, you're going to do it. You're going to eat it. And I ate it. And it was about an hour or so after we're, we're already heading down the road. And I'm like, I'm not feeling nothing. And then I look over at Squid, and Squid's just sitting there grinning and looking into oblivion. And he's like, man, it hits you in waves. And then the first wave hit me as soon as he said it. And the waves just got bigger and bigger and bigger. I first thought the bus was falling over on its side. So I'm pushing myself in the back lounge against the table in the center so I wouldn't fall over thinking that we're tipping over. Then I look over at somebody else and they, they're grinning, which started making me laugh. Now, I started laughing to the point where I couldn't stop laughing so I ended up starting to cry. I mean, I started bawling my eyes out because I could not stop laughing. I started losing my shit, man. And uh, they're like, man, he's really flipping out. So I ended up going down the, the downstairs lounge and they made Rich Barr, who's our uh, our stage man, or he was one of our carpenters on that. They're like, make sure he doesn't jump out of the bus. So I went downstairs, and now I'm really flipping out. You know, my mouth just fucking goes dry. Everything I can't do. I'm afraid to go to sleep. I finally throw up. And ironically, it was all over Opie's briefcase, all of his advanced paperwork. <laughs> so I'm like, I've got it all over me. There's fucking puke everywhere, all sorts of shit. But now I feel okay. So then I was like, all right, I'm going, I strip off pretty much all my clothes, jump in my bunk and sleep to Zurich. Get to Zurich. I'm still tripping balls in the afternoon. Fucking check into the hotel, go back to bed, wake up at 10 p.m., go across the street, have a piece of pizza, go back to bed, get up for a little call the next day. And I'm walking around that, you know, at the time it hadn't been refurbished yet in Zurich, the arena. It was old, like, Bellodrome. And I'm still tripping balls fucking 36 hours later <laughs> you know and it was like so yeah that that was the only time i've ever ate that shit and i'll never do it again awesome. so that's yeah not my either not my deal no no they had they had a lot of fun at my expense for a while trust me yeah shit like nice. that that would go on a lot <laughs> all right so a question i like to ask everybody so i was going to put together a podcast and uh, my, I was hanging out with some of my high school buddies and they have kids now. So my buddy's daughter is in fifth grade and she came out with great assertion. And she said, you need to ask all your guests when they first felt famous. So remember, we're talking about little kids. So to broaden it, when did you first feel famous? Maybe when did you first feel you were on your way? When was there a moment where you felt good about yourself, um, where your career path was good for you? some pivotal moment in your life it doesn't necessarily have to be about music it could be about anything mm. ron i'll let you take that one first oh that's a tough one <laughs> when i first thought i made it um i don't know the first time i got to ride on a tour bus was pretty cool that was a that was a pretty big moment and sleep in a bunk and not have to drive the truck yeah uh you know working my way up to actually to uh you know, sleep at night in a bus. Um, when I got, when I left the Guns N' Roses tour, or the Eagles tour, no, the Guns N' Roses tour, because I left mid tour, because my son was, it was getting close for my son to be born, and I already made arrangements, like, I, I have to leave on this date. So they bought me a plane ticket before I even went on the tour. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's kind of cool. They actually listened to me, and I'm going home on the date I said, I'm leaving a tour which they only did two more shows before a riot happened anyway. So it didn't really matter. But I was like, well, that's pretty cool. Like I get to fly home tomorrow. And, you know, I, I had to give up my bunk for my replacement and 
the next day just took a cab to the airport and flew home i'm like wow that's pretty cool i made it <laughs> that didn't get me off the road though i still got one more tour after that but i tried for three years to get off the road it wasn't easy yeah so that that was a pretty cool moment uh of, of making it i guess right on what do you got out of boy it was probably it was probably august fest 99 when uh I rolled back through Columbus. That was the whole thing of working in that town and coming up through the ranks, but then leaving, you know, and then going somewhere else and disappearing from the sight and scene of all your old buddies and stuff. And then coming back through as a road guy. Yeah. You know, here you are, you know, it's like you made, you made it out of town. You made it, you made it on the road. You know, you're finally on your way. And, you know, that, Getting to come home victorious was probably something that I always thought that was the best feeling ever. You know, yeah, right. yeah pretty cool. And then everybody wants to get a backstage pass. Who? All your buddies, like, hey, dude, you made it. Can I get a ticket? Can I get a pass? Like, no, <laughs> wrong gender. Sorry. <laughs> Joel still does that to me. Oh, does he? Do I? <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> Do you guys have any uh, good last show wind up stuff? Mm. Yeah, actually, you know what I do? It's like uh, it was on Kelly Clarkson. Um, we did our last show up in Washington at the uh, White River Amphitheater in Washington. As a matter of fact, I went from the Eagles from Europe straight to Kelly Clarkson. I didn't even go home from tour to tour and uh so we were pranking the opening band pretty pretty hard you know there's some band called rooney oh and, i know rooney. Uh, that was a keith yeah. Morrissey band <clears throat> yeah so uh we took all the wheels off their trailer and put them on top of the trailer they couldn't find them they weren't looking high enough um we had uh, we had done all sorts of things to them we'd screwed like some of their case lids together um we ended up actually grabbing, like, uh, some of the guys were playing during the whole leg of the tour playing dice for money. So we actually rolled a mutt case, an LSD mutt case, down the thrust, to the center of the thrust during the show, really set, and we all played a couple hands of dice, you know, betting, you know, for cash during the show. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> then after we got done doing that, after then we, uh, we grabbed, they didn't see it, we grabbed one of their techs. They had a big stand-up base case. So we grabbed one of the two backline guys they had. We stuffed them in the base case. And just drove the case out in the middle of the stage and then left it there. So the band thought it was funny. So the singer is now standing on top of the base case, not knowing that his tech is inside, you know, trying to get out. So when the singer finally gets done and gets off the case, the other guy runs out, unlocks it. Dude jumps out of the case and one of the, as a trooper, fucking grabs the case and takes it with him get it off stage so you know they could do the next song so you know <laughs> maybe we did a couple more things to him but yeah it was like that was always some funny shit that's great so i don't really have any wind-ups but I, I do have one like really messed up request that happened on a show and it's we were doing maxwell and for one of his encore songs he wanted to have a hundred lava lamps on stage for the encore song and so Barry Claxton, it was his account, calls me and he goes, hey, this, this wants, this, he wants this to happen. What do you have to do? And I'm like, a hundred lava lamps? He, that you don't just put a hundred lava lamps on stage and have them work. You're, those are going to have to be plugged in for hours ahead of time, somewhere backstage. They're going to have to be ready to go and hot. Then we got to get a hundred lava lamps on stage. How are we going to do that? And he goes, well, tell me what you need because he wants it to happen. And I'm like, well, okay, send me a, a lava lamp tech. And a bunch of Edison cable and waiver strips so we can plug all these in backstage that load in so they can get hot during the day. So Jim Petrison came out and he was the lava lamp tech. He came out of the shop. I think it was his first tour. He's like, what do I got to do? And I'm like, you got to take all these lava lamps and plug them in every day and warm them up. And then we would have everybody on the crew, all the backline guys and all the stage hands for loadout because it was the encore song. Everybody we could get would grab a lava lamp in one hand with a glove because it's hot and the base, take it out on stage and place it. And then 
Jim was out there plugging them all in on stage with all of his, his power strips that he had set up. And it never failed. Somebody would pick one up and it's hot and it would burn their hands and they would drop it. And now you have hot lava liquid all over the floor and it's really slippery. So we usually lose like one or two lava lamps a night. That huh. was the most weirdest, strangest request I'd ever gotten. If Alan, having to deal with a hundred lava lamps for one song. When you did SDP, did you guys do all the Christmas lights? No. Uh, no, they were on a turntable. So it was limited to what we could do. So we would set them up and then they would spin. And then, you know, the, the other band comes off the stage. There were no Christmas lights. I was the Christmas light. That's Lee Gibson's big deal. I was the Christmas light tech. And <laughs> I had to fucking hang Christmas lights every day. And then Nina the, is the wardrobe person. And she she wanted Christmas lights up in the dressing room because the band liked it. So next thing you know, I'm putting the Christmas lights up in the fucking band dressing room on top of putting them at the show. I hated it. And this one year. Hmm? You were the Christmas light tech. Fucking Christmas light tech, man. And then this one year, I uh, remember when Lee used to live in Burbank. So he called me over. It's emergency. It's emergency. So I'm like, okay, fine. So I leave my house and I drive over to his place. He wants me to put him Christmas lights at his house for Christmas. He had just bought them. I, was, I did not think it was funny, but I put him up, man. I got him. I put him up. That's why I was a good sport too. It was good. <laughs> Fucking guy. Me and Ron were supposed to be gigging together about two years ago. Really? Right before, you know, and we were, uh, I was uh, some, uh, like edc festival thing or whatever it was lost lands i think it was yeah. called yeah out just outside of columbus and right before we were all supposed to start gigging we got the word to say hey no they don't want us now it's like but we signed you know months ago uh we don't, we don't need you oh i was so pissed off yeah you were almost <laughs> ready to jump in your, in your rv and drive from california out to columbus yeah i was leaving the next day yeah oh, i could start driving out there Mm. Oh, well it's better yeah you got any good aussie stories with all those years of Ozfest? oh you first Ron. you because you did what 98 yeah i did it 98 it was I always know. it was you know, being with ozzy was amazing and he had the the water cannon and he would just go to the front row and they would squid would turn on the pump and he would just blast everybody in the first like 10 rows with water and it's you know, you always look in the audience and some of the girls were painted. They didn't have clothes on. They were painted. They do this. They would do this body painting thing in the in the concourse. So you look and like what, what? What's going on? Just look like she's got a wet shirt on. Oh, that's not a shirt. That's just the painting of a shirt. <laughs> so it was hilarious um, uh, with the Aussie and just just to just to be there. And it was he was such a great performer. And then he get off stage. And it's like, wow, that's a totally different guy now once he's off stage. Yeah, he's really quiet. I mean, it's like, you know, just really chilled out and stuff. He doesn't become that character until he hits the deck. I put in my book that he would sit on the bleachers and watch STP always. And he'd watch like the whole set. And he never blinks, man. He just sits there and he, he doesn't blink. But he was a big fan. He watched all the shows. No. He was a lot of fun. I mean, I did, yeah, from 99 till 2007, you know, a constant. It was... Uh, that many of them? Huh? You did that many OzFest? I did five OzFest tours. Wow. And then Black wow. Sabbath tours in between, you know, and then single, you know, and then the Aussie runs themselves. Um, yeah, it's like, once again, so... <laughs> so in 2000... Um, Squid was still doing the water gag because we had the guns that he, Ozzy would have where he could squirt everybody. Then we had water cannons that shot off the downstage truss. Yeah. So we had like fireman hoses running through Denver Beach that were about eight inches wide. And of course, whoever was doing it, it was Squid didn't do it in 2000. It was uh, Terry. His nickname was Biff. His real name was Terry. And man, we gave him so much shit because it was just like, He'd run that damn thing right through the middle of Dimmer Beach, or he'd put brakes right where all everybody's tails were for power. You know, shit would be underwater in the middle of the day. You know, all sorts of stuff was happening. And, um, and, and the hose broke out the truss and water went everywhere. Yeah, multiple times. You know, there was, uh, 
but then we also had a water chair. So in the middle of the show during the guitar solo, this uh, it was a Tate Tower. Uh, the, the, it was like a zip lift, but they were inverted it, where three things would like act like a zipper and actually make a thing to where they could get this thing to come in and out. And Ozzy would get in the chair and do it. Well, we loaded in a day early, and one of my techs would normally go up and do it. Well, it connected the chair and everything. Well, he didn't do it that that afternoon. Ends up getting shit faced and doesn't show up the following day. So we're you know so we're there in the morning and we're getting ready for doors and stuff. They bring the chair down to test. Craig Baker, who is the bass tech, jumps in it goes up they turn it on fucking hose up in the rig goes everywhere this trashes the whole rig fucking knocks feely the drum tech right off the drum riser douses the drum oh. douses rich bar stage manager 20 stage hands up stage video wall so and all i can hear is fucking rich yelling for fucking sean and i'm like over stage drink going he ain't here we oil spotted him and man rich was fucking fuming all day long you know, without damn hose. And then it was always, it was, that water gag was always something. You know, you never knew what was going to happen. It broke apart dimmers one day and all the fucking dimmers were starting to get underwater and shit. And I was just like, you know, and then they made them powerful enough to reach front of house. So then when Ozzy can step on a pedal, you know, one year, you know, Opie gives us the, the thing goes, yep, have Viscuit for front of house now because that shit can reach out there too. Oh, or wow. like, man, it never ends. There's this water everywhere, <laughs> you know. Well, that's a that's the thing when you do shed tours and it rains, they'll start throwing mud clods. They just pick up the the grass from out all the people in the back, and they'll just start throwing mud clods in. And so you have to have protection at at front of house so that the mud that's flying in doesn't get on the console. Yeah, we uh, in uh, in two thousand, Godsmack is performing, and. Uh, we were up in Blossom up in there in Cleveland and it looked like a fucking war movie. The sky turned black with nothing but sod. It had been raining all day. They pulled the whole hill apart and we pulled like three 55 gallon drums of sod off of the stage. Fucking front of house was covered. You need a lawnmower to get in front of house. <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, it was really bad. And that's when they started recording all the audio all day long because if anybody was ever heard inciting the crowd to do it that was the band that was going to have to pay to get the whole hill resodded at any event so from that point on it was like you know what it's like you know don't instigate the crowd you could be paying your eighty thousand dollars you know whatever you, you're making on this tour well i saw that on a, I was, I was, it was um uh lincoln park was one of the opening opening acts at like two in the afternoon and nobody's in the in the seats but the grass was full because all those all the people that you know were in the grass wanted to see lincoln park and so he just gets on the mic and he goes i want all of you down here now and there was a swarm of people coming over the seats they weren't even taking the aisle just a wave of people from the grass coming straight towards the stage and I looked at it, I look at the people coming in and I'm like, this is scary. I'm, I hope they're going to stop. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty weird. I mean, just plowing past security guards. So a whole riot full of people in the front and they just demolished all the seats in the front of the, in the front seating section that were all just the folding chairs that are zip tied together at the shed. And Sharon Osborne was pissed when they finished and she, she like the, the band. I, they almost got fired from the tour. She was so mad, and that's probably why they started recording it. Because, yeah, they incited a riot. Then they had to get security had to come in after they were done, clear all the people out, put all the chairs back because those were expensive seats and those were for people that wanted to see Ozzy. Yeah. Don't mess with Sharon's folding chairs. No. That's the moral <laughs> of the story. Don't piss her off. Period. You know what? All the years I worked for that camp, it was just best to stay out of the way. You know, that way you never, you know, Ope could fucking tear you a new ass all day long. That was okay, you know, because, you know, you, you you just got what was ever coming. And then next day was a new day. But once, you know, upper management caught an eye on you, yeah, your your time could be limited. So, so did you do OzFest in 2000? Yeah, I did 99, 2000, 
Fuji did 2001 because I was on ACDC still. And then, and yeah, uh, and then right after Ozfest, we were one of the few tours that went out after 9 11 on the Mary Mayhem tour. That one was Ozzy, Rob Zombie, and uh, Mudvayne and Soil. And we had, oh, Jesus Christ. We had Santa Claus burning on a cross. We had all these, all these different gigs. We had uh, what they called the Hell Set. Um, no, the Hell Set was for 2000. But we had like more like an ice wonderland looking thing. Um, we had a potato flake truss, so it had snow. We had snow machines, pyro for days, two different potato pyro companies. Flakes? Man. Huh? Potato flakes? Yeah. Shit would be mashed potatoes. The end of the night, man. After this shit went off, man, the whole floor was nothing but mashed potatoes. Well, that's it was, it was horrible. But we had to hang 22 two-ton motors um, in the seats with all-access uh, track so we could pick up this sled. And it would be supposedly Ozzy would come out of this big, huge uh, present at front of house and then go over the crowd and then land backstage to start the show. And that's how we got the, the show started. And uh, I mean, we, any kind of buffoonery on that one, because we had like, we had eight uh, little people out there. And man, those, I mean, we had them dressed as, we, we had them dressed as evil dwarves. We had, um, from the OzFest, we had a... See, I remember in 2000, am I wrong, but they'd have like little people weddings, like in between. Do you remember that? Yeah, we always had little people shit going on somewhere. That was just a thing that Ozzy had for some reason. It was like, it was funny shit. Um, we had a freak show uh, person that was, and his assistant, and they dressed, dressed up as Mr. and Mrs. Claus. So you had Big Dave, who was one of the people that worked around the Osbournes. So it was him, the freak show guys, and the people, and then the midgets all on one bus. And there was always some buffoonery going on. Somebody lost their fucking scorpions on the bus. Fucking drunk midgets everywhere. You don't know where they went. Fucking shit went on, you know, at the hotel. It was drunk midgets somewhere. You know, some kind of buffoonery happening. Was Fuji out with you with the midgets? No, no. That, I mean, would I can been, only that would have been amazing. <laughs> oh, he would never have left him alone. He would no, have, it would have no. been brutal. No, he'd probably dress him up in all sorts of shit every night because that man could just do anything. I mean, as he was, I think it was one of the uh, the, the 2001, they told me that there was like uh, where you could, at Pittsburgh, where you can hit the golf clubs into the, or golf, golf balls into the lake. Yeah. That he went and there's like, like there's a little island or something in the middle there. And you know he would do like naked load out. He went out and swam naked to the you know to the island. My favorite with Fuji, what we would do on STP, people after the show they they'd be like, "Is Scott Weiland still here?" <laughs> like, yeah, he is actually. If you just go down there, and it was Fuji, we'd always take a shower, and he'd bring this huge brush to like wash his back, <laughs> and he had like a hairnet. And, we'd always, and he would sing always. So he'd be in there singing and there'd be people like, hey, whoa, how you doing? Come on in. And and he'd be sitting there butt-ass naked taking a shower and we'd send everybody, oh yeah, they're, Scott's right there. Go check it out. <laughs> it was great. He had, yeah, Fuji had no problem with being naked around anybody, anything, anytime, anywhere. Well, he's such a good looking fella. Well, yes, he is. He's quite, yeah. quite the, you know, Adonis. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's pretty great. No, but the, the Ozfest tours were always anything Aussie related was always some kind of buffoonery happening. You yeah. know, it's like you can guarantee every year we always had something. You know, when we had like Manson out in 03, um, Zach Wild was Zach was getting pretty rambunct, you know, just drinking a lot and getting into a lot of trouble, terrorizing other bands, scaring them. He was just being full on Viking alcoholic drunk. I was like, that was some funny shit. Um, one, the last one I did in 04, it was Sabbath and Judas Priest. That's and cool. going back to the whole air spraying of the girls and stuff, Opie came up with this wise idea to have me, they were, they were going to dress me up as the cowardly lion and present Rob Halford a birthday cake in Philadelphia. 
<laughs> so they went out and bought biker shorts. That was, that was the only thing I was going to have on was like te- you know, tennis shoes, biker shorts, and they were going to spray me from head to toe to, and then do my hair out so it looked like a lion's mane. And then I was supposed to come up to one of the elevators with a birthday cake for Rob that night. <laughs> and I did not want to do it. And Why? I, it's such a great I, idea. What the fuck? I don't know. I was just like, man, I, you know. I would have been Toto. And, well. All fours happened, behind you. Yeah. So, I mean, they, the Opie had me like on a computer, you know, back then, this is, you know, 04, but we were like doing the whole camera thing. And he's got Jake Barry on, on their end. And I'm modeling these biker shorts wearing them, you know, for Jake. Opie's telling him what all he wants me to do and all this stupid shit. And it didn't happen because <laughs> uh, Ozzy got sick and couldn't show up for Philly. Oh. So we were bracing for a riot. We didn't know what was going to happen with the band. And we always started to show we had a curtain. It was just a manual pull curtain. And all of a sudden we hear that Rob Halford's going to do the Black Sabbath set with the band you know, in place of Ozzy. That's fucking cool. And, and, and they filmed, there, there is some film of it, of a certain songs. And uh, we were told, it's like, all right, we're going to do a couple songs, see how it goes. If the crowd's not buying it, we're going to close the curtain, push all the back line all the way to the, the dock, close the doors so the crowd can't get to the back line. We can replace all the rest of the gear except for the back, you know, the band's gear if this is what's going to happen and then everybody run for it because if they run for the stage you know they're going to just trash everything and uh was a normal load-in for guns and roses that's how we yeah did well once again Opie, you know knowing the heyday of guns and stuff knew you know what crowds could do and you know the, the band comes out announces that ozzy's sick crowd is not happy i mean there was a philly crowd even though we're camden you know, it was, you know, that Philly crowd, they were pissed off. But, you know, instead of, you know, Rob Halford's going to come out and do the whole set. The first four or five songs, it was kind of rough, but then the crowd warmed up to it. And the whole time, I mean, we were loving it. I mean, and the whole time, we are going, you know, are those the words to the songs? Because we've been there to hear Ozzy singing for so long, these same songs. I and mean, then actually hear them actually spoken correctly. We, we were like in shock. It's like, I didn't know that was the lyrics to that song or this song, you know. <laughs> it's like, we're just shaking our heads going, holy shit. And uh, Sharon had, had gave, I guess, the pay to, to Rob that night for doing the show. And he, and he gave it to all of his crew and stuff after that, which I thought was really cool. That is cool. You know, it was, uh, that was a memorable day, you know. But man, you know, once again, you never knew. Like the whole ATV accident that happened in 2003, I was getting ready to go to Europe to do an Aussie run, and I got called going, we're not going to Europe. Aussie's in a hospital right now. You might not make it. <clears throat> and it was right when the ATV accident happened. You know? Um, you know and we started an OzFest, and right after rehearsals, we got word that Sharon was battling you know, cancer. Yeah. So we loaded out of rehearsal and shut it down for two weeks and then waited to get the word before we started back up again you know so there was always something some kind of spinal tap or issue or something happening you know with you know with the tours but we always ended up pulling it off and it always ended up great and all the kids were we made all the kids happy in the end which all matters you know that was good got any dan stories for me either one of you right you toured with dan too right ron yeah I'll let Ron go first. I've been talking for a while. <laughs> no, you're good. Your stories are hilarious. I haven't heard these. I don't, I don't really have any stories. He was just fun to work with. Oh. He was always on point, full energy. And he liked to eat pie. Remember every day after he finished loading it, like around showtime, he'd have a coffee and a pie. And I'm like, really? That's, that sounds like a great idea. And so I started doing a coffee and a pie. Like once the show would get started and everything was running smooth and I go have my little coffee and pie and just kind of kick back, wait, wait for loadout. I don't remember the pie. That. You don't remember that? No, I don't remember that. And Dan would cook things from time to time. He, sometimes he'd cook pies or do cakes or whatever. 
that was the whole thing with his eccentric character was that you know from from having issues in the past and stuff and then being clean and sober for all the most of all those years it was he just took that those eccentric habits into other things yeah you know and it was uh it was always doing something funny but the the, the we brought him out on acdc on the big on the uh stiff upper lip tour in australia because we always had the bell this come it was on an inverted motor so the bell would drop down for hell's bells but it just came down there was no effect so they decided to put it on a moving track on an i-beam and have it more out in the crowd because we had a runway that went out into the crowd so we had it start way out in the crowd so it would come down, but it would track towards the stage. And then as it got to the stage, Brian Johnson would run on, jump on the, the rope, and then we'd start the, the dinging. And then it would take Brian out into the crowd more over the runway. Well, we're in, God, where were we? I think it was the second or third show in Australia. I think we were in either Adelaide or at this point we might have been in Melbourne. And uh, I think it was maybe Adelaide, maybe. And uh, Dan was having some issues with the controls and stuff. Something wasn't working right, but ended up getting it under working. And then it came time for the show. So song's getting ready to come up. Spotlights hit the bell. Bell's not moving. And we're like, all right. So we're all, we're all standing there. You know, and the song won't start until it gets to Brian anyway. He's got to be able to jump on it. That's when I start ringing. So it finally, it, it comes down, and, but it keeps starting, stop, start, stops. And then it stops like halfway. So then Brian's like, you know, the hell with this. I'm going to run, I'm going to run to the bell and jump on it while it's down on the runway. Well, as Brian starts taking off for the bell, the bell starts taking off and going away from him. So Brian is now chasing the bell down the runway, trying to catch this fucking thing. So it stopped. You know, so then the, it finally stops, but then it starts back up, going back upstage, is now chasing Brian Johnson back to the stage. So you see Brian running for his life, and the bell is fucking falling right behind him. So Brian gets you know closer to where the bell can't get no more. And then Brian sees it. Okay, now it's stopped. Now he can't. So then Brian turns around, jumps on it, and finally starts the song. So oh, there he is. Yeah. So we're you know we're all dying because we were watching this whole thing going on. So the song ends, and you know, and Dan's taking the bell, and you could tell he was so embarrassed and frustrated. He was just shaking his head. The one job he has out there. And at the same time, you hear Brian after the song go, man, who is driving that bill? Ray Charles? You know, and it's like, which is, there's a recording. You can hear the recording. Somebody's got it. But it was just like, <laughs> and, and we played it every day for Dan when he was testing the thing. You'd hear uh, over the PA, like, you know, Ray Charles. Like, Who's driving that bill? Ray Charles? You know, <laughs> fucking Dan. Did you do Ricky Martin with him? Uh, no, I didn't. Thank God, because I heard that was, I heard that was a hellacious tour. I mean, it was like, that was like Cooper and Sarge and uh, Tim Schiavone. I heard, I heard people were scared. I heard Springo was scared to go on the lighting bus because those guys were so out of control. Really? Yeah. yeah he made the, you know, his dance shirts, and he made a shirt that was uh, for Ricky Martin. It said, "I do the work of ten men." And that was his like inspirational phrase on the back of the shirt. And they were always trying to make me a man. That was a big deal. Dan was like mission in life was to make me a man. So I put a gaff tape over where it said 10 men and I wrote 10 boys. I do the work of 10 boys. And he was so, he was like laughing, but he was so offended at the same time. You know, he was calling, it's not funny. I'm trying so hard to make you a man. And I'm like, ha. <laughs> that was a proud moment. It was a proud moment. He had, he had a bunch of different swag that he was kind of pushing on for a while. Um, I still have my STP bit shirts. Those were from yeah. uh, actually Dan and I did them together. 
we put a uh, he made them but i uh we came up with the phrases together it was uh i forgot that the logan on the slogan on the back but it was pretty good it was always a good projecting strength oh you see <laughs> dan was always good if you were talking to a cute chick in the crowd you were you were guaranteed that he would sniff it out and he would get there and ruin it for you within five seconds so I'm on a date, right? I'm with this chick uh, that I meet on a, on a computer site. I'm in Venice, California, and I'm walking across the crosswalk with this chick and there's this dude in this Jag and he's honking his horn at me. And I look over and it's fucking Dan. So he's like, get in the car, Rifkin, now. So when we got to get in the car, she goes, I don't know if that's a good idea. Do we even know who this guy is? Got to get in the car. Trust me, it'll get way worse. Just get in the car and just agree. So we get in Dan's car and... He's like, so what are we doing here? Well, I'm like, well, we were on a date, Dan. <laughs> and he's like, hmm. He goes, what's the date about? Well, we're going to Best Buy because she needs to get some electronic equipment. And then she needs to go to a uh, yoga thing. He goes, well, how fucking romantic, Rifkin. <laughs> so he, he, we all go to Best Buy together. He's just full on Dan the whole time. He's intense, man. And the girl, I think, is just petrified with what, what the fuck just happened. You have two roadies just at you so then she's like i need to go i need to get to yoga on time he goes does it bother you that you're that stressed out about getting to yoga on time when yoga is meant to de-stress you you need to think about this <laughs> and the girl is just like getting angrier and angrier because she's not going to make it to yoga and um so the next time i saw dan he goes so how did it go i'm like well how the fuck do you think it went dan and he goes well did you guys go out again yeah, right. <laughs> I'm like, no, I never called her again. There's no way she would ever talk to me again. Thanks, Mr. Cupid. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you want it ruined, call in Dan. He, he, he'd be your man for that. It wasn't going to work out anyway. Nah. <laughs> but yeah, I was random walking across the street and you see Dan in his car. <laughs> Anyhow, well, unless you guys have any good stories or any more stories, you can call it a day. Uh, I'm trying to think uh... anything sunny I'm actually trying to get sunny to come on with cat and uh, Sonny's all about it he's been writing to me left and right uh, cat's a little bit hesitant so Sonny was one of the instigators on my on that first tour um, on that first Oz fest it was like I'd be trying to hide they're like yeah you need to go pick up chicks looking as dumb as we can possibly make you and I'd hide this and that and then one day actually met a whole bunch of girls that were like, really cool. They were really cool chicks. But when I did that, that sealed my fate. Cause then every day I had to go out and find, you know, partying girls. And then it was like, and, and make me look as most ridiculous I could possibly look to try to do it. And I'm walking around an amphitheater all day, burning up. Everybody else is hanging on the bus, taking naps, doing whatever. And here I am this looking like a complete fucking, you know, dork trying to do this shit. And Sonny would just not leave me alone. He was like, nope, you got to do it every day. You got to do it. You got to do it. That sucks. What about Roger Waters? Roger was cool. That was, that was a neat, that was a really neat gig. You know, we had, uh, I'm trying to think if there was any, I don't think there's any over top stories. Um, it's not I can remember off the bat. Oh, but when he'd go into the politics thing, boy, there was a couple times I thought we were going to, oh, front of house was going to turn into a fucking, you know, just a shooting gallery. Oh, and yeah. He, he, yeah, because he was, he hated, you know, the big orange tea. So, and matter of fact, the second half of the show had a lot to do with some of that. And we had people that were walking out, like, and yelling all sorts of shit and stuff. And, so that wasn't going good in the states. It was normally pretty much the red states that you know you could imagine. Of course, when we got when we were in California or Washington or New York, you know the crowd loved it. So it was whatever demographic you had at the time. Yeah, um, but that was always sometimes a sketchy part of the show that you never knew if something was going to really go down or not. We'd have people come and yell at us in front of house, and I was like, like, "Hey, man, it's it's his show. We just you know we're just here to put it up." You know, yeah. said, don't blame us. You know, I'm I'm independent. I'm, <laughs> you know, non-political. 
Did you, you know? do uh did you do John Mayer or Prince with Carrie Charbonneau? Um I did when I did I'm trying to remember if I did with Carrie. It's like uh I did 2008 John Mayer. Oh, that was a thing on, on John Mayer. We uh we stopped, we were up in Connecticut and we stopped for gas, and it was the lighting guys and the catering shared the same bus and we were going down to the Borgata down in, in uh, Atlantic City so the bus everybody has went to bed at this point they start you know bus driver pulls over gets gas and then heads down to New Jersey we heard one of the catering girls scream at the top of her lungs early in the morning when we got there we're like what the fuck is going on some drunk guy fucking got on the tour bus when the driver wasn't when he was like doing something else or fueling or whatever and went and passed out in the front lounge and rode the bus from connecticut all the way down to jersey no way yeah i had no idea who this guy was or anything he could have been a murderer drug dealer just plain out homeless nobody knew who this cat was but after well, when they just you know freaked out it scared that dude, and he got off the bus and ran away. We never saw him. We, we never knew what happened. Other than that we had some freeloading guy fucking, you know, take a free ride from Connecticut to Jersey. That has messed up. That's a Which now reminds me on Waters, is like when we were in suburbia or uh, Serbia, uh, one of the border guards, I think we were coming in from Bulgaria, and so when we were going through the next, through the next country, one of the border guards jumps on and pretty much gets a free ride to the next border as we cross the country. He stays on our bus for four or five hours. You know, didn't ask permission or nothing. He's like, I'm riding with you to the next border. And you guys know like, sure, it. whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we ended up feeding them some beers, this and that. And we got to the next border and said something in his native language, and that was it. Didn't see that cat again. <laughs> it's like, right. you know it takes a while to remember all these stories and it's like after you start jogging the mind you know they all start all starts yeah. coming up uh, yeah i'm trying to think there's, there's a cool game i don't i don't have a whole lot of debauchery because i was that eye contact which means that once the lighting rigs loaded in i have to go fix moving lights when i was on the road when i was when i first started so other guys would go out and they would pull chicks in the audience and they'd be in the bus I had to fix moving lights, drop them out of the rig, change them, save the save the show at the console, back it up. So by the time I got done, everybody else has already gone off and had fun, and you know they're hanging out in the bus, and I get in there, and then I miss all the I miss all the excitement. So I, it was pretty boring. But one thing we did do that was fun was lug nut roulette. So when we would we'd have a day off, and the bus driver was in on it, he took the lug nuts off the lug nut cap, and he wrote a number. He numbered all of them. And then you put all the numbers on a piece of paper and then we do a $5 buy-in or, or you could do, sometimes we do $10 buy-in. So there's 10, I think 10 lug nuts. So the pot at a $10, that's, a, you know, a hundred dollar pot, whatever number, whatever lug nut is closest to the top without passing center is the winner. And the bus driver would call it when he would get to the hotel and then look on the paper and then somebody would win a big pile of money. That's yeah, fun. Probably, I never heard that. It was fun to do on a going into a day off because it would just give you something to look forward to. See we you needed you to fix the icon so we could light our cigarettes. <laughs> light something on fire. Holy shit. There's a lot of there's a lot of backdrops of holes in them because of those icons. Those things were tanks. Yeah. Yeah. I do have one one dwarf uh, one midget story I can tell. Um How could you miss out on that? Yeah, that's uh it was a little risky. It was it once again going back to uh, Ozzy Black Sabbath stuff. So after my first Ozfest tour in '99, we continued on as Black Sabbath for a leg. And um, at the time, there was a, a little guy named Mark. Um, his nickname was Stripe. He, I'm trying to remember Mark's last name. He worked actually worked for Charlie back in the Rat days, like '85 or something. Oh. He was, when the band was being managed by, fuck, I'm trying to remember, um, Milton Burrow's brother, who was the band manager, 
um, this was a friend of his that did stuff in LA and he calls up Charlie one day and goes, Hey, I got a friend that needs a job. You think you can put him on rat? And Charlie's like, yeah, send him down. Not knowing what was going to happen. So one day I guess this little guy shows up and goes, Hey, you know, my name's, you know, Mark. It's like, you know, he said, you can give me a job. And they're like, okay. And I guess the rolling stage for rat was only like four feet tall. And they had like color changers and all sorts of shit. It was show lights rig at the time. So they ended up having, you know, what his nickname became Stripe for another reason. Um, so they started having Stripe doing all the stuff under deck. And then that's when they are also having those hot pans that used to be used for fog or for smoke. <laughs> you used, used the hot skillet and then the, and the fucking dry chemical. That's a long time ago. Yeah, that stuff that that's what they used for smoke would probably might probably give anybody cancer in 10 minutes if you fucking get a good whip of that shit. And then when all the guys would go up and focus the rig, Stripe would have to run back and forth around the stage, you know, and they're like, Stripe, more smoke, more smoke, you know, and he'd have to go and light more shit up on the and on the hot pan just so they could see the beams for focus. So Opie calls me in one day and goes, Hey, I have a friend coming in. I need you to babysit him. Well, once again, I'm, I'm the pet, you know, so it's like, you know, whatever I need, needs to happen, I'm, I'm the one doing it. He goes, my friend, I need you to take care of my friend. He's going to show up, you know, would you uh, just keep an eye on him? If there's anything he needs, you know, I'll take care of it. So we have a day off in Memphis, and this is when Stripe shows up. Right off the bat, he starts drinking. And he is putting down vodka like I've never seen anybody drink before in my life. I mean, he was like turning down half a bottle of swallow. And it was like, oh my God, this is insane. And then he gets on the piano uh, in the lobby. We were at that Piedmont or whatever that, you know, famous place was in, in Memphis. And uh, yeah, he starts getting down. I was like, man, this guy's a hell of a player. And he's attracting all sorts of attention. So Sonny Satterfield decides it's a good idea. So Sonny, Dan Jan, and myself end up having to take Stripe to a strip club. <laughs> and we're like, oh, yeah, the girls are going to love this. And it's like, and so he's like, oh, I'll take care of it and all. So we end up taking them to some place in, in Memphis. About drinks fucking Sonny to, to broke. I mean, he just is like drinking everything in sight. So we finally get done. Bars closing. Like, man, we got to load in in the morning. We got to get back to the hotel. Get back to the hotel. Opie gave me his room key. So I pour Stripe into Opie's room. And he is this, and Stripe is just talking a mile a minute. He had not shut up since we left the club. <laughs> so, of course, you know, Opie pokes his head out from the bed, you know, up from the covers, and Stripe's all about talking. I can tell Opie's like, He's like not happy. It's like, oh, gotta listen to this asshole. You know, we got loaded in six hours. So we leave next day. We're all loading in. Obi left Stripe there at the hotel. He was gonna have the runner pick him up. Obi told the runner, he goes, look, whatever this guy tells you, you are to pick him up and bring him straight to the arena at the pyramid. And the runner was like, Yeah, no problem. Runner takes off. Don't see the runner for three or four hours. <laughs> they're like, so they finally give the runner a call. They're like, where are you at? And they're like, oh, he's like, well, the, the guy you had me pick up wanted to stop at a bar. So basically, Stripe hijacked the fucking runner for three hours while he got fucking loaded up at the local bar around the corner from the hotel. <laughs> so now fucking Stripe is shit faced. Fucking, we get him in. So now I'm pushing around. So somebody gets the bright idea that, well, I wonder if, you know, if there's uh, any promiscuous people that would be interested in uh, sorting out our friend. So I guess back in the day on the rat tour, you know, girls loved, you know, midgets. They were just, you know, all about doing whatever, whatever kind of freaky shit there was. It was all about it. So here I am pushing this fucking midget around the parking lot of the pyramid in a wheelchair Fucking going, hey, you want to meet the band? Got to blow a dwarf. Want to meet the band? Yep, got to blow a dwarf. <laughs> and, and it was just one of those deals where we, uh, 
it was just it was funny we were just doing it at this point just because we were abusing ourselves there's nothing more that we can do but then just be complete assholes and see where we can take this buffoonery to, to the max not thinking that any of this would happen so at this point um you know doors open the show is about how fuji started his career <laughs> the dwarf. so we uh the doors open at this point now i've told the local stagehands what i'm up to so they get in on it so they start asking people in the audience it's like hey it's like you want to do something you know deviant with a dwarf we got one it's like you know the steward's wife comes up to me and goes hey we think we found this girl that would, you know, you know, would like to meet this person. I'm like, you got to be shitting me. Really? So she's like, yeah. This girl is downstage, on, is hanging on, just barely hanging on to life and on the barricade. She is fucking trash. <laughs> and she's like, I want to meet Ozzy. And I'm like, and I, I go over to her and go, oh, I'm going to go to hell for this. I listened. I looked at her. I'm like, well, if you want to meet Ozzy, I tell you what, you need to talk to see that little guy right there. That's a good friend of Ozzy. <laughs> I bet if you talk to him, he'd be able to manage that. Things ensued after that that became that really got out of hand. And I, I can't really go any further than that. <laughs> Other than the fact, but I, you know, it was. Uh, why do they call him Stripe? Gremlins had came out in in, in eighty five. Oh, yeah, totally. And there was some stuff where he would wear a gremlin mask. You know, they ended up going, you know, because being a little person and stuff, they had found like some costume place, so they would dress him up as the character Stripe from Gremlins, <laughs> and he'd you know just be a deviant little individual back in the heyday. So. Awesome. You know, that's, you know, so that was, so, so babysitting Stripe that day, you know, got me, you know, kudos and, you know, took me out for dinner for, you know, taking care of him and stuff. This is the funny shit that went on with that guy. You know, he came out another time we were on TLC and we had to put all the booze up in the, uh, up high because if Stripe could get a hold of the booze, he'd drink the whole bus dry. Literally, he would drink. If you had seven or eight bottles of booze, he would drink all eight bottles of booze. Jesus. So Is he still alive? No, nah, he passed away uh, four or five. No, 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 yeah, a little while back. Um, but man, when he was around, man, he was some funny shit. You know, and Opie's like, "Yeah, don't let him drink. Whatever you do." And I rode the that night when we were on TLC. I rode Opie's bus. And we all got had drinks and, and told stories and stuff like that. I woke up the next day. I was in the back lounge. I woke up as the door woke open. Stripe, for some reason, had rolled out of the bunk. And he looked like a bulldog. And he had a sock in his mouth. I don't know why he had a sock in his mouth. But he looked like some fucking dog. And Opie's over top of him, yelling and screaming, I can't believe you fucking did that. How in the fuck? What were you thinking? Why the fuck did you do that? And I'm like, what happened? He goes, well, Stripe can't fucking reach, you know, piss in the toilet because he's too short. So what he did was he grabbed the bus driver's good Guinness glasses and decided to fucking let it roll out in the front lounge when our production assistant came out. So they're, you know, Stripe is basically just taking a piss in the front lounge in, the, in, the, in a Guinness class, you know, drop trowel in front of everybody, and then just tosses it in the fucking toilet and that was it. So the whole time Opie's yelling at him, he's, you can tell, you know, he was half yelling and half grinning. because There was some funny shit. <laughs> Alicia was not happy. She was she was not happy at all about it, you know. Is that but Alicia Logan, yeah. Oh yeah, because she's it, pretty goody goody. Yeah, she she was just like, what the fuck, you know. Of course, she told Ope, and Ope's like, I can't believe you fucking did that. <laughs> at the same time, she's like, yeah, we can all believe you did that. <laughs> I totally believe it. Who's Alicia's one? Is uh, I think it's Eddie Money. She loved Eddie Money. So if I'd piss her off, I'd be like. So, you know, I talk about Eddie Money and then she'd be like all happy with me again. <laughs> she thought Eddie Money was the man. There, there were certain things that could warm her heart. She's a nice person for real. Yeah, she was. You know what? When, you know, and there, even when some of the buffoonery we were doing was going on, you could tell in the back of her mind, 
she she could go there too it was just like for as much and as so i don't know she would smile maybe she had it in her i don't know you know it was like in the back of her mind she you know she still had that deviance in the back so every so often you know she'd hear some story you could see her grin and it's like uh-huh yeah she's like you i know? need my own stripe i need a stripe at home oh dude mm. They're, they are high maintenance. Do not do it. I'm telling you, you're going to be 24 seven fucking midgets pissing in glasses, throwing piss everywhere, fucking drinking your drinking things dry. Fucking, you know, ugh. those, yeah, the Pantera story is probably outdo anybody else's stories. They I were, say in my book, like basically story, 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 but there's always just a little bit of a one up and that's Pantera. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, they, they were hard to beat, man. I mean, they just did not give a shit. <laughs> Staten, he had a couple good Pantera stories because I guess Cat was always fucking up equipment and stuff during the show. So there was two times that he, uh, I guess there were cyber lights on poles and stuff behind the back line. And Sonny be yelling on comms, like, hey, these fucking lights are all over the place. What's going on? And Cat would wrestle them during the show. He just he just go up there and grab them and start fucking throwing things around and shit, and uh, so Bill decides to put a, a fucking open wire to the chassis of them. So next time Cat grabbed a hold of one, <laughs> he hit the fucking switch and electrocuted his ass. So one day Cat got stuck on one. He literally was being electrocuted and couldn't let go, and he let him fry for a good 15, 20 seconds. Before he finally killed the switch, because the switch didn't fuck. He was holding it. So he was like fucking just electrocuting the shit out of fucking, you know, Brooks, man. So that was one time. And then there was times where I guess he would, uh, the cat would take a running leap and jump on the cable pick stage, right? And slide down it. He'd jump on some cases, jump up, and then slide about five or seven feet down on the cable pick. And the trusses are swaying back and forth. And so he's going, what the fuck's going on with the rig? So Bill took a bunch of zip ties. Oh, and put them all down the cables and then cut them. So the next time the cat went up there and did it, fucking gutted them. Just, just cut them from fucking top to bottom with all these zip ties. And it was just, and this fucked him up. You know, and then that still didn't stop him until the, you know, some of the bills from LSD came around. Then I heard cat was like, you know, going to catering and collecting tin cans and stuff, trying to recycle so he could pay for all the debts. For all the fucking gear that you put, you know, you know, putting damage. <laughs> you don't have to ask him about all that. So he's got all those stories. I had on uh, somebody and they were saying Geezer Butler. Geezer Butler had was just, he has this dry humor. And they're like, he's a funny motherfucker. Oh, yeah. I mean, if it's that, it is that British humor of like, you have no idea, you know, and, but if you have this nice, you know, mellow tone talking, but if you understand where the sarcasm's coming from, oh yeah, that's some. He's, he'll, he'll say some funny shit. Yeah. Well, all right. I really do appreciate your guys' time. Yeah, man. Cool, Joel. And, uh, thanks for the stories, Ron. I'll see you soon because Ron's rewiring my house. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, we're on a two-year plan. Very slowly. Very slowly. Very slowly. It's pretty dark in here at night. My girlfriend's happy. Shut up. It's not dark. <laughs> I got my closet light doesn't work, and that's fucking Ron's fault. Isn't that disgusting? I can't believe I live like this. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe by clicking the round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or the guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle's Joel Rody. And don't forget, when you party like a rock star, don't be a dick. <laughs>